Good day, I'm Martin Gago with Market Radius Research. It's Friday, April the 8th, and we've got CEO Dr. Armand Balboni joining us from Apili Therapeutics. Apili is a drug development company focused on infectious diseases. I'm eager to learn more about Apili because the company has a very strong and sophisticated management team and board of directors with both the technical capacity and capital markets experience to potentially grow a very successful drug company. I am a shareholder, and I suspect that after last year's disappointing phase three trial results, the market has overreacted. And at current prices, given the company's pipeline, team, and balance sheet, there's potentially considerable value in the stock at current prices. Trying to better understand the value drivers over the coming quarters and years, and specifically better understand the significance and details of the company's recent announcement regarding its new funding from the U.S. Department of Defense for Apili's biodefense vaccine candidate. But please remember, this is neither a recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Dr. Armand, thank you very much for joining us, and please tell us about Apili Therapeutics. Well, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Martin, and um, and thanks for being a shareholder. And I and I I mean that uh, for everybody, um, including myself. I'm a significant shareholder of this company, um, and um, and and I think uh, I, I'm happy to talk about where we're going and and where we've been because I think that's an important component of that. Um, the lawyers, as always, uh, encourage me and then require me to put up the forward uh, looking statement and the disclaimer. Um, and so I do wanna talk about the company because I think some things have changed and some things haven't changed. We just haven't had a chance to discuss them. And, and as folks remember, um, or they may not know, uh, I, in, in addition to being the CEO of the company, I've, I've spent um, uh, more than uh, almost 20 years in the US military. I'm still a, an active reservist and an officer um, in the U.S. Army uh, uh, Medical Corps and Reserves. Um, I'm a physician and a scientist. Um, we've always had a very strong relationship with the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, and, and our Favipiravir program, folks may remember, grew out of my experience on active duty in the Army for the Ebola outbreak in 2014. Um, and, and so we've always had this undercurrent of, of DOD uh, activity, U.S. DOD activity, um, and, and we continue that today. Um, the reason um, that uh, the US government frankly likes to work with us is because we're honest brokers of data. And I think the Favipiravir trial in light of so many trials around the world that were underpowered to show that the drug worked or didn't work, um, ours was large enough and was definitive and actually demonstrated unfortunately that the drug didn't work as people had hoped. Um, but it's that honest broker of uh, being honest brokers of data that I really hang our hat on. Um, and so I think I, I agree with you. We've been in the penalty box a bit for that. I think the markets have overreacted personally, um, but it's time to um, get back to talking about what has always been there. And that's our solid and diversified pipeline. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of room in the, in, the, in, in the space to talk about it during the COVID outbreak in our trial, but we've always had multiple development programs with incentives to include priority review vouchers um, to really do good and do well. Um, we have a strong growth strategy and, and a good financial foundation. And of course, as you said, a proven um, leadership team. What our pipeline Dr. Looks Armand, like, sorry, yeah. I, I don't want to dwell too much on the past, but just to, I don't know, uh, puff you up there. That trial that from the fall, that was a big trial. Like, Huge. Yeah, and, and just to sort of compliment you, to like to execute that and run a, a large trial like that's, you need some sophistication and, and, and horsepower to know what the heck you're doing. Yeah, I, I, and, and I think that's where our, the strength of, of, of the company, of where Apili is, and, and personally what I've been doing for more than 20 years, which is trying to bring drugs forward through this uh, uh, kind of gamut of, of challenges. We did a 1,300 subject worldwide phase three trial to look at efficacy of, of a drug in the middle of a pandemic, and we did it. Um, you know, we completed the trial and we showed as part of that trial, by the way, uh, which is which will be uh, fully published. Uh, that's part of our responsibility for this. Um, we anticipate that publication coming out very soon. So folks can look at the details. We saw a 50 percent reduction in hospitalizations at the midpoint of the study, but it was still underpowered. And many people at the time, our, our partners were saying, well, let's just go forward with that information. And I had to say, well, the study isn't designed to, to do that. We, it's not definitive. 
we've got to run this to the end because there's so many studies that stop halfway through saying, aha, look, it works. Um, and what we found out is by running the full study that was well-designed and well-executed, that the drug did not in fact work. Um, so it was a well-run, well-executed trial, to your point, in the middle of a pandemic, the largest that had been run to date, um, which really put to bed whether or not that drug worked. Um, and and uh, Japan, uh, Fuji has subsequently withdrawn their phase three. Other studies have, uh, other countries have withdrawn their approval of the drug um, based on this work. And so while it's not the outcome we wanted, I really am proud of the team because of what they did in the middle of a pandemic to get such a large study done and really um, to take a drug away from folks where it was not going to have an effect. All right. So, um, you know, and, and again, um, it allows us now to leverage that experience and the, and the, the US DOD recognized that. And I think they recognize that by awarding us um, a, a, a greater than $10 million US, which by the way is greater than our market cap in order to, um, um, for better or for worse, right? This is the undervalued part, um, to run a study for a tularemia vaccine, which is a biodefense vaccine. So ATI-1701 um, is a program um, that builds off of uh, our experience in this space and, uh, and will allow us to move forward. We still have our novel antifungal, uh, ATI-2307, which is moving forward in our 1503 program, um, as well as the ATI-1501, where we've announced recently in press release that the NDA should be submitted this year. Again, demonstrating that we've taken a, something from an idea through all of the studies necessary under 505B2, uh, partnering it with Septalis, um, announcing the expansion of that partnership, and an NDA will be filed um, later this year. So again, to your point, we, um, we really know how to, to run um, from, from A to Z on these things, and, uh, and that's what we're doing. With um, your, on the general strategy, when your molecules that you sort of bring through the process, are you in licensing them or does your team actually sort of start them from academic sources or, or do you sort of bring them up internally? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I'll come back here for a second. We actually do both. Um, I'm very proud to say that ATI 1501 came from my own clinical experiences. That was an idea um, that we had uh, based on uh, my work uh, with, uh, with patients who were having trouble swallowing. Um, that's an oral resuspension of metronidazole, very, very important and widely prescribed. Um, it wasn't available as an oral suspension for this formulation. Um, and uh, we brought that forward from idea through to uh, uh, now an NDA that will be submitted with a partner. Um, ATI 1503 um, came from previous work done in industry and in academia. And we brought that in-house and we did the, the bench chemistry work in-house um, to develop the library of molecules. And so that was a little bit of both. ATI-2307 was a classic acquisition. We acquired that molecule, um, a phase two ready program from Fuji Film Toyama Chemical. Um, it built our relationship with them. Um, and then ATI-1701 was an acquisition out of NRC in Canada um, uh, because we, we recognized the unmet need in the space in a time when it was not very popular to go after biodefense vaccines. I think we see now with what's going on in Russia, um, that the Russians are um, uh, potentially bad actors in the world um, and weaponized tularemia is a thousand times more potent than anthrax. The DOD came back and said, this is a, a, a program of interest to them. And so we are the most advanced um, tularemia, potential tularemia vaccine program um, out there right now. And, and they recognize that with more funding. One of the other things that we do um, is not only recognize unmet need, but we really also leverage this idea of um, incentives and revenue streams. And so the reason we do that is because um, there are certainly R&D funding efforts, which we leverage as in, in the form of non-dilutive dollars. We've raised, uh, as part of our raise, uh, we about 35 or $40 million of, of the money we've raised for the company, um, uh, representing just a bit less than a third um, has been non-dilutive. And that's great for shareholders um, in the form of government grants. Um, certainly regulatory reforms, we're looking at PRBs and incentives, um, um, LPAD or accelerated approvals, um, and then additional revenue streams, including government stockpiling or the Pasture Act, which is coming. So we have our ear to the ground with respect to anti-infectives. I don't think we, anybody would argue about the importance of those moving forward, but by far, the priority review voucher program is an active and uh, uh, integral part of our thinking about programs. These are vouchers that allow the holder to accelerate FDA review of any NDA. Um, there's, a, there's an active market for these um, in terms of uh, being able to sell them. 
Um, I think uh, one of the other things we've done recently, and I think the, the public has seen this, is that we retired some LIND debt with um, long zone holdings, Jonathan Goodman of Night Therapeutics. And the reason I bring him up and the reason he was interested in, in stepping in and really working with us is because he at night sold one of his PRVs um, for uh, which, which in excess of $100 million. Um, we have two PRV programs. It's an active part of what we do. Um, there's a known value for these once they're approved, but it's, it's another way that we build value into our programs. Both 2307 and 1701 may be eligible. And as a bit of a teaser, I think the, the public can expect that we'll be having more um, announcements um, that leverage this idea. So bio potential biodefense or government contracting um, and PRV eligible. Again, it's this idea of doing good and doing well um, with what we do. Wait, sorry, can we just go back to the PRV? I wanna make sure I, I, I understand it. So if you investigate certain um, uh, uh, um, target areas, the FDA will give you a PRV, which sort of allows for an accelerated process through the FDA. You get expedited meetings and you, your file ends up on the top of the file. Is that correct? Yeah. It is. And so actually, you were, it, it's actually um, a little better than that. It, it actually, it's an expedited FDA review for approval. And so you can imagine that a company, and it, and it gives a six-month clock. And so it allows the holder of the PRV to get a six-month review clock, um, which guarantees that they go to the front of, it's kind of front of line privileges. And so they, they can be sold on once. Um, so the holder of the PRV can sell it once to somebody else. It's then stuck with them. Usually the, the, the purchaser of those, the sellers tend to be small companies that you see like Liminal Biosciences or, or Miriam Pharmaceuticals. And that's what they sold them for. Generally, the people who buy them are large pharmaceutical companies. You can imagine that if you have a drug that's, gonna, that's going to sell a billion dollars in a year, if you can get that review, and the normal review cycle is at least a year. If you can reduce that by six months, it's six months, it's worth $500 million to the, to the company. And so they've been willing to pay 100 million or so, um, anywhere from 60 to 300, um, uh, depending on, on who buys them. But they've averaged out at about 100 million dollars um, for for a um, for a PRV for that voucher. And and so it's an active part of what we do um, to to go after programs where we think um, we can compete. Um, that these are largely um, uh, infectious disease programs that are off the radar for most companies. But we know that if we if we include PRVs in our um, our NPV calculation, that it actually becomes a tractable program for a company as small as ours. Um, we have a small footprint and a small GNA um, spend. And so it makes sense for us to do that. A larger company, $100 million may not move the dial all that much, but for a small company like us, it makes a huge difference potentially going down. What the road. milestones do you have to hit to be sort of given this PRV? So, so it's a multi step process, um, and it's fascinating because first you have to go after indications that are largely unmet with an unmet need um, in an area that's neglected. And so that's like a, a biodefense um, uh, uh, programs, um, tropical diseases uh, that are unmet and, and some pediatric indications with unmet need. And we tend to focus on the tropical diseases like our, our uh, 2307 program for cryptococcal meningitis, um, for example, um, or our 1701 biodefense program. And so medical countermeasures is another area. Both of those are highly specialized areas that most companies don't have the expertise in, but we've developed a team that's worked on, on many of those products. And, and I have to say, I work um, on, on a huge number of products, so almost 100 clinical trials in my time in DOD that kind of meet those definitions. DOD, by definition, tends to go after these kinds of indications because of uh, they, they don't really care about commercial tractability. They care about where do we send our soldiers, sail sailors, and airmen, and what are they going to encounter? And those tend to be neglected diseases, tropical diseases, or things that are not necessarily um, often found. And so we've, we've made it a specialty. Um, so first you have to identify unmet need, then you have to identify a program, and then you have to get your drug approved. And once the drug is approved, you can then submit for the voucher. And so- What do you mean uh, by approved? Like going through all three phases of, um, like passing phase three? Uh Yes, and getting approval. So for example, um, uh, had favipiravir worked, it was PRV eligible because it was a medical countermeasure. And so had that drug been approved, it would have been eligible in addition to tremendous sales. It would have been, a, it would have been um, eligible for a priority review voucher um, once it was. So that was, a, you know, we, were, we ran the phase three study in about a year. 
The difference with our 1701 program, which we'll talk about in a second, the biodefense vaccine program, that's approved under what's called animal rule, a very specialized pathway for approval, which um, does not require phase one, phase two, phase three, because you can't challenge people with weaponized tularemia in an ethical way. And so you use animals as a proxy. Um, and so that's a, that's, a, that's a shortened or accelerated process. Um, similarly, if we were to go after um, a tropical disease, those tend to be orphan diseases. So the studies tend to be smaller and quicker. Cryptococcal meningitis for our antifungal um, is, a, is, a, is an unmet need, a rare disease, a tropical disease. Those studies tend to be much, much smaller and much quicker. But that's a specialized area of regulatory and clinical research that we are um, um, experts in. And most companies are not. And so we've, we've decided to build the expertise to specifically leverage the PRB process and move these things through quickly. I hope that answers the question. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating area, but if we ever have a dinner party, you can guarantee that I'll be the one talking about PRVs and, and how we do things. But I, I find like it you're fascinating. You're invited. Next time yeah, you're invited. A lot, a lot of companies, a lot of companies, it's a very specialized area. And, and so we are um, a specialized company um, in, a, in a very unique space. And I think we leverage that. So with things going on in, in um, uh, Ukraine right now and with Russia and North Korea continuing to be what I consider bad actors on the international stage, tularemia um, as a biodefense program is something that we are very, very interested in. Um, <clears throat> Francisella tularensis is a bacterium, uh, which is a bacteria that it gets into cells as intracellular. It's a thousand times more infectious than anthrax when it's weaponized. Um, and weaponizing it means you make it easier to inhale. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, as few as three spores can kill you if you inhale it. I mean, this is, this is a, a pretty terrible um, uh, bug if it's, if it's made like this. And the only two countries that have been known to make weaponized um, uh, tularemia are North Korea and um, Russia. And historically, people have been working on this problem for a very, very long time. There's no FDA approved vaccine available. It is a medical countermeasure, which means by definition, it is PRB eligible. Um, and the solution we believe is 17, ATI 1701. It's a live attenuated tularemia vaccine candidate. It's superior to the, to the um, a vaccine that is used by lab workers, but it's never gonna be approved by FDA because of some manufacturing problems, but it does give us a benchmark. And so what we've demonstrated is that ATI 1701 provides 100% disease protection in a mouse model of aerosolized tularemia. We also have a non-human primate model versus the only thing that's, a, that's available under LBS. This is what the government um, is so interested in. These data are very, very strong um, and, and um, they, are, they want to move this program forward. So it, it, it's a, a unique development path, but one that we've been working on for a while has been going on in the background quietly. This is not a new acquisition for us. Um, but the government has recognized one that we're good arbiters of, we're honest brokers of data. Uh, we report things when they don't work um, and we report things when they do work. And so we've also done a non-human primate study. Nobody has ever gone out this far before. We've done nine, 28 days and we've done 90 days. We've also done one year challenges. Um, these are the benchmark um, gold standard studies. Non-human primates obviously is, is where you wanna do these. Um, and, and we've demonstrated again that we can, we can uh, uh, have animals survive um, a, a challenge. It is protective against an otherwise lethal dose of, uh, of uh, Francisella tularensis. Importantly, it's, it's recognizing how this is likely to be work, uh, to be used. Um, this, is, this is likely to be used um, in, a, in a, um, a, a, a war setting. Um, soldiers will go into an area, they wanna be denied. Um, there will be a release of this. Someone will, will present with symptoms. Um, you want to vaccinate soldiers, sailors, airmen, and civilians potentially um, uh, for the short period of time that they're going to be exposed. And so having protection that goes out 60, 90, 120 days is great. Um, it, I don't anticipate that something like this would ever be used seasonally or something like that. This is really in response to a bioweapons release. But there's a mechanism for this, and that's um, a stockpiling. And so these are usually stockpiled by governments. These are large contracts, and I would encourage folks to take a look at the anthrax um, uh, programs where we hope we never have to use these things, but they tend to be hundreds of millions of dollars in government um, contracts um, that are renewed every three to five years. 
um, because they have to replenish the stock. And we never, this is, this is the insurance policy you never wanna use. So DITRA recognized um, uh, our work. Um, they've expanded um, um, their support. They've been a longtime supporter of uh, the tularemia vaccine program. And in February, they announced funding for Apili um, and we'll be providing um, over $10 million. We've not guided on the exact amount, but it's um, more than 10 million um, to advance ATI 1701 to an IND submission. We're in contracting discussions with them now. Um, and Apili will serve as the prime contractor, meaning we oversee the, the, the full development plan that includes tech transfer of clinical trials material, um, GLP, IND enabling talk studies, regulatory activities. Um, and, and we expect to have execution within H1 of 2022 of the contract. So full negotiation and uh, funding, um, we'll, we, we will confirm um, that upon contract execution. The 10 million or over $10 million of funding, how is that administered? Do you spend money and they reimburse you or do they write a big check at one point or, or, or how is that structured? So um, as governments are loath to do, they will not write a big check and then just give it to you um, because they want to have some control over that. It's um, a reimbursement mechanism, again, a specialized area where we have a lot of expertise. Um, and so generally what you do is you do work um, you submit, uh, you can submit as often as monthly, and then you get reimbursed 30 days after that. Is there any mechanism for like, you have to spend $1, every dollar you spend out of your balance sheet, they'll give you another dollar. Like, is it a matching program or will they just, can you use that full $10 million to fully fund uh, the program? So the money has been earmarked. Um, it's been designated for this effort, um, the full amount that we, that we land on. Um, and so it's a three-year contract, um, the base contract for this full amount. Um, and it is, uh, it's reimbursable for direct and indirect costs um, to include uh, GNA. And so the, the time and effort we put into this, they recognize that that's incredibly valuable. Um, so it pays for those activities as well. So it's not just a direct cost, oh, you spent a dollar, um, therefore you get a dollar back. It's, um, it's those direct costs, plus a lot of those indirects, the supporting activities. You can imagine that the regulatory burden on government contracts is very, very high and very specialized. Um, so we, we get paid for that as well. And then also just for our administrative oversight, um, for all of the other subcontractors that are involved for manufacturing and potency assays, for example, or non-human primate work, um, we get paid for that for the oversight function as well. We are, is... we are the ultimate designated party here. All right. Like there's obviously it takes a lot of the company's resources. Do you get to like sort of build in some margin into it to sort of to, to sort of profit from it as well, given the opportunity costs? We, we absolutely do. And, and so we'll be ready to discuss what that looks like once we have the contract executed. Um, but there are kind of standard benchmarks that are used. Um, and and uh, we are um, we are adhering to all of what are called the FAR and the DFAR, which are the, the government regulations around what these contracts have to look like. Um, but there absolutely is um, a, a built-in um, activity cost, if you will, um, or profit, um, because they recognize that management and, and operations are so important here. And sorry to get nerdy on the accounting side. Yeah. Does it sort of just come as cost recovery? So it'll be kind of invisible on the income statement or will it show up as revenue coming in as sort of a contract fee? So um, it will, so I'm not an accountant and so I can't geek out with you on this, but my understanding is that there is a GNA plus up, if you will, um, for administrative overhead. So whether that shows up as, Profits. I'm not sure how the accounting works on that, but it actually takes into account our time, our efforts, and it's forward looking, which is really important. It's not just backwards looking like, oh, you have an accountant that spends 40% of their time. What do you need going forward in order to manage this contract? And what's a reasonable overhead rate um, to, uh, to administer a contract? And so that actually flows to us as a company. They don't want to hurt the company for an opportunity cost for taking on something that is just as large as this. This is a huge undertaking. And, and you can imagine that we'll have to build out um, the, the team um, and account for, uh, for, for time and effort for all of that. So whether that drops to, a, you know, a, I, I don't know the accounting treatment of that within the company, I'll leave that to my CFO, um, but, but you can imagine it absolutely gets covered. Okay. So, you know, I think one of the important things, again, just to not to spend too much time on it, but the, there is um, 
potential um, stockpiling opportunities. And these are the these are the comps that I would suggest folks take a look at. Um, so someone may say, well, you can't go down to the shoppers and buy this vaccine. It's not that kind of vaccine, right? Hopefully, if it is, we're in much bigger trouble. Um, but the governments do purchase these for the for the stockpiling, and those benchmarks um, are listed. Some of those benchmarks are listed here. The most recent is the SEGA um, stockpiling benchmark, $629 million for 1.7 million courses of smallpox um, antiviral T-pox. And again, that's a that's a five-year contract for 629 million. It's re it's re-upped at the end of the five years. Um, and those are continuing contracts. Bavarian Nordic very successfully um, had an earlier version of smallpox um, emergent, um, and then uh, SEGA again with their early version of smallpox. And, and the, the reason we have them up um, in addition is that these are recurring contracts. Companies are specialized in this biodefense stockpiling space, um, and, and uh, we're building up that expertise as well with our programs. And importantly, all of those programs were PRB eligible as well. And so those are the, those are the uh, those are kind of like the roadmap for us as well. Right. So sure. I, I do have a couple of questions if you can sure. um, uh, like back to that. So on um, an earlier slide, slide four, you had sort of the the phases. This only you only need to do a phase one trial where you give it. And, and that's on humans where you give it to them just to make sure there are no adverse reactions to it. But you're obviously not trying to infect them with them. Um, with this, but you're, you inject it into them to see if there's any issues. That's, that's, so that's one part. There is, a, there is a phase two component under the animal rule, which means that you substitute an animal, probably a non-human primate, um, for humans that you challenge them to show that, the, um, that it is protective. Um, and then you look for a biomarker that's similar between humans and animals. And you, by extension, say, because the non-human primates, if that's the model, um, survived, um, and they show this kind of a response, we can, we can expect that humans will similar, similarly survive. But the safety is done in phase one, um, probably in about um, 75 to 90 um, healthy volunteers for humans for the phase one, and then you would do a, um, a follow-on to our previous non-human primate study as a phase two. And the phase one, I, on the, that's a 20, would, uh, is, is expected or planned to be a 2023 event? It is correct. So we, we believe that's a 2023 event. Of course, it's all it, it's all all of this work that's being funded now is a lead up to that um, phase one study in 2023. Gotcha. So the, the $10 million kind of plus gets you potentially to the start of a phase one. So the goal the goal of the of the grant, as it's stated in the in the statement of work, is uh, funding to accelerate um, and to uh, continue studies in order to drive an IND enabling phase one. So you're correct, yep. Oh, okay. And then typically I presume with animal rules and animal studies and relatively small, they go a lot faster than um, uh, human trials. So in sort of a reasonable world, how long would it take to get to your phase three results? Yeah, or the equivalent results, yeah. right? So the efficacy results. So I, I think, um, uh, Right now, I think really what we can look at is a. I think we're looking at a, to be safe. I think it's a 2025 um, event, um, just because while these things do go, they can go faster. Um, it's really it, there are two issues. One is it's really hard to get non-human primates right now. Um, there's a, a, a shortage, um, which is a terrible thing. Um, but um, you know, it, so things always take a little bit longer. And with these kinds of programs, you really safety is the most important issue. Um, and so, uh, because you're dealing with, uh, you know, uh, potentially weaponized uh, uh, challenge studies, um, and so it, they they tend to be expensive and always take a little bit longer because there's so few people doing them. But but we believe 2025 is a reasonable, um, is not unreasonable in terms of a timeline. So um, we have a ATI 2307 again, another PRV program, which is a broad spectrum novel clinical stage antifungal, um, and and really uh, we're going after two indications here. The candida indication on the right, um, uh, as you look at your screen, um, uh, is, is a very large market. Um, it's kind of the more common market. But what we do, again, is we look for ways to, um, to uh, build value in the programs. And, and we've decided um, that there's a huge unmet medical need in this idea of cryptococcal meningitis um, or cryptococcus, uh, where we show a lot of activity. Um, this is a, an orphan indication. It's PRB eligible. 
And so this is, again, getting to the strategy of what do we go after and how do we do it and how do we leverage our expertise? And so it's an opportunistic invasive infection. There's a heavy global um, disease burden with high um, mortality if untreated with not great outcomes um, with current, current uh, drugs. And so we've just, we've, uh, we're, we're pushing forward with that as a, a first indication um, with a follow-on indication of the larger market um, uh, candida market. And sorry, just going back to that very quickly, these are the um, infections that often happen in hospitals where they're hard to get rid of and, and um, they sort of spread around. You, get, you end up in the hospital ending up being sicker than what you did coming in. Absolutely. And so um, now, that, uh, now that we can stop talking as much about COVID-19, um, there's no question in my mind that the um, uh, resistant, and it's the resistant fungal infection that specifically we, we are targeting, um, is going to be a much bigger problem. Um, and, and so uh, there is no question that the C. auris um, is kind of this, the, the super fungal infection. There were a number of outbreaks during COVID. Um, it is an opportunistic infection, not the fungal infection that folks mostly think of when they think of things like their toenails. This is a systemic fungal infection very, very difficult to treat, um, not a lot of great options, um, particularly in the resistant um, uh, space, um, and uh, something that we will absolutely be talking about more going forward. So again, it's about trying to get ahead of the curve with our, with our company and the product, and again, doing it in a way that actually makes sense for a company our size. And the treatment right now is these are highly antibiotic resistant. They, you, the patient gets heavy doses of stuff, which then creates lesser immunity and, and more um, and so forth. So they, they, they don't have, there's no good solution. They just hit them yeah, with so really hard antibiotics and hope for the best. Yeah. And so um, just a, a slight correction there. They, they are, um, they're fungus, um, okay. or fungi. So it's an antifungal. Um, but the drug that's used is something called, the, the primary drug that's being used right now is called amphotericin B, um, or in the anti-infective space, they call it amphoterable. Um, it's actually a really ter it's a really hard drug to use um, with your patients and with your patients you're always titrating them and you've got to spend a lot of time and the, and the, drug, the drugs are very toxic um, and the, and more importantly the fungi are becoming resistant to it um, in certain cases and so so the options are not great um, my infectious disease colleagues were always clamoring for something right and so a few companies have stepped up and so there's activity in this space. But we've also created a, a, a niche for ourselves um, that does not directly compete with those companies. And so, um, you know, there is opportunity here for four or five or six new drugs. There's not been a new drug in this space um, outside of um, uh, amphotericin uh, really in the last 40 years. And so there, there's really a need. Um, and, and I'll show you a little bit later. A couple of companies are stepping up. Um, but again, it's, it's a real underserved space um, with a high unmet need. And that, that's really what gets us going as a company um, is this opportunity where others aren't playing, but we have some expertise that we think we can uh, fill the gap. There seems to be a huge unmet need. It's a terrible uh, illness. Uh, and the drug companies have huge balance sheets. They can, they throw billions of dollars at things. D have they not been pursued because it's just a really hard thing and they don't know how to deal with it? Or are there weird economics associated with it that where they, they just don't see the the, the, the profit in it or? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of reasons. And I think you've touched on both of the primary. One is a very difficult problem to solve. And the reason it's difficult to solve is because, um, not to get too um, geeked out with science here, but, but you know, fungi um, are, are eukaryotic organisms. We humans are eukaryotic organisms. And so drugs that tend to work against fungus also tend to kill humans. And, right. and so that's why the drugs are so toxic. And, and so there, there, there's that problem. You don't have that problem with, with, with drugs that target antibiotics because they have a different um, uh, uh, metabolic system than humans do. And so if it hits an antibiotic, if an antibiotic hits a bug, it's probably not gonna hit a human the same way. And so that, that's the first problem. So you, you hit the nail on the head there. They're really, these are really hard problems. The second is that, you know, frankly, the markets have not been great. Um, and, and so the, the, the problem is that amphotericin B um, and some of the other current drugs that are available, while they're toxic, um, they are cheap. And, and so it really makes it difficult um, to, to um, develop a new product because um, in, unless you have something that's novel um, or you're going after a, a, um, a very, very large market, 
it's hard to make a return. And so for large drug companies, they have large balance sheets, but they have large expenses too. And so they just don't see the value there. And I think the best example of that is um, the cryptococcal meningitis market. Um, cryptococcal meningitis is an inflammation um, uh, or a fungal infection that leads to a systemic all over the body um, infection, um, but particularly targets the lining of the central nervous system of the brain. And when that swells, that's a closed space um, and not good for your brain. Um, it tends to squeeze it and uh, it's, it is uh, deadly. And so not a lot of cases in the US. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a tough market to, to kind of justify. It used to be much higher. The developing world, the burden is much, much higher, which is why it's PRB eligible. And no one has created something new. And so for a company like ours, with only 5,000 scripts a year, we do believe that it's a $350 million market um, because it's such a deadly disease in the US, but there just aren't that many cases. And so large drug companies tend to not be interested in this. And their, and their reason for, for, um, for being around is not to solve a problem in the rest of the world. Frankly, until COVID came along, there were very few companies that were developing anything for the rest of the world. But what we saw is that because, of, and because of that, the FDA set up this PRV program. And so we believe that when we do the NPV analysis, that with a small market of, uh, uh, with the premium pricing, and we think that's supported by research we've done, um, of $350 million plus $100 million plus for a PRV, all of a sudden it makes sense for a company of our size. Um, and so again, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a basket approach, but it's a way to build value. Where the real value I think for this, for this program is, is in the refractory or resistant candidate market, many, many more cases. And this is a case where um, the, the drugs that have been around forever have stopped working. So they may be cheap, but they don't work. And if they don't work, you're likely to die. And so we think that building a program around this backbone of a PRV and then adding on top of it, capturing a piece of the U.S. refractory or resistant market um, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, uh, an analysis that actually works for the company. And so, again, it's taking a, um, a different approach, a business approach to how we do things to do good and do well in a space that maybe other companies couldn't compete. And, and when we start to layer all of our programs together, that's when our company becomes really attractive as, a, as I think, as a takeout target. It's not any one thing alone, it's the aggregated basket of products, which is why we built the company this way. And so we can also uh, importantly survive things like a failed phase three clinical trial because we take this approach to building a basket of products to, to, to continue to show value for our shareholders over time, even if things don't work out. And I would guarantee that if, if you're in the business of 100% returns on, on, uh, on, your, on your development programs, you shouldn't be in biotech. Many, many of these things will not work. And so we think a basket approach um, and then layering it um, with a smart approach using PRV is, is, is really the way to go. And if we just take um, an antifungal benchmark and look at the valuations of others who believe that the antifungal space is a place to play, I would point to um, um, a recent um, re, uh, re uh, design of an old drug by Basilea, um, which that the total, I'm oh, sorry, the total value of that program over time um, was $700 million, right? Um, and, and they had a mid teen royalty back to them. Pfizer acquired it. Um, this is a space that's very attractive. And frankly, Crescemba is not a great drug. Um, but there are other valuations um, uh, that I think are worth looking at. Um, a company called Synexis, um, uh, $88.9 million valuation, Sidara, uh, $45 million, and then um, Amplex, for example, as well. And so others recognize that this space is valuable and they're going after it. And what I said before is a lot of these drugs don't, all of, none of these drugs target cryptococcal meningitis. They all work in that candida space, a more traditional space, but there's room for three, four, five new drugs. And so again, we're taking a layered approach to this. I um, mean, we think frankly, our drug is, uh, is, a, is a great drug. So um, I would argue that um, our valuation today doesn't represent what we think the value of even um, one of these programs is um, uh, as, as we move forward. So something certainly to think about for folks. The last program I wanna talk about is one that I, you know, we started talking about. You said, where do things come from? This one is very near and dear to my heart. Again, it's never going to be a billion dollar blockbuster program, but as a company our size, we don't need it to be. 
Um, and again, it's a do good, do well approach. It's a taste mask liquid metronidazole. Metronidazole um, is a very, very common um, drug um, that's used for, uh, they, they used to use it more for C. diff, it's used for amoebic dysentery and other GI dysfunction. Um, it's used a lot. The problem is that um, uh, it's heavily prescribed in the US, but there's no liquid oral form. And, and I was working in, a, in an old age home in New York um, and, and I had um, um, so, some patients who were residents there. They all had, um, they all had dementia um, and, and uh, they, had, they sunsetted towards the end of the day. And for whatever reason, I would leave and, and come back the next day and they would all come up to me and say, I think the nurse is trying to poison me. And, and I would say, I don't think the nurse is trying to poison you. Well, what they were remembering, even in the, they didn't remember where they were or, or, or sometimes who they were, but they remembered that they were getting metronidazole pills the night before to solve some GI problems. The problem with, um, with this drug is it, it tastes horrible. I mean, not just like, oh, that tastes bad, but bad to the point where people with dementia, frankly, remember it the day before. And they used to try and hide it in applesauce and all that did is make the residents hate applesauce. And so I said, there's a solution here. The solution is, well, why don't you just, I asked the pharmacist, I said, why don't you just make it a liquid? And he said, well, it's really hard to do. It falls out of solution. And I said, well, maybe we can solve this. And so when I came to Apilli, the first thing we worked on was this idea. I said, let's get some good chemists on this and, and really create a drug um, that we can take in a liquid mask, taste mask, liquid metronidazole. And we did it. Um, we, we demonstrated um, that we could make it. We demonstrated that um, there was clear palatability improvements versus just, versus just crushing the tablets. And then we said, um, let's go find a partner for this. And we, we announced um, a license agreement with Sotalis um, for US rights in 2019. They're also manufacturers, so they're gonna be making this. And then based on that work, and what we see now is that they finally came around and said, this is a, a real product as well. And we've expanded our partnership to add Europe and Latin American markets. This will be NDA filed in 2022. Um, we've gone from idea to an NDA filing. This may never be worth more than 25 or $30 million to us. But again, as a company our size, um, this is a real product. It does real good for patients. And I think it will um, do well by our shareholders as well. So, you know, again, I hope the folks get a flavor for what we're doing. Um, we're really a company purposely built to advance our infectious disease programs, but more importantly, um, it's how we look at the landscape. Um, we have a robust in licensing, in -licensing strategy <clears throat> to identify overlooked assets. We're really agnostic to technology, but we look, um, we're looking at lots of things. As I said before, um, we look to pharma and academia and government agencies. We have another program that we'll be announcing very soon that I think you'll see fits this profile. Um, but we're constantly analyzing in discussions with folks. We are a transactionally oriented company. Um, so that means we're building relationships. Um, and I think over the long term, we'll build uh, relationships and, and have strong relationships, both with DOD and government, um, with, uh, with academia, because we're always looking at things, and uh, with pharma, who are, who are always looking at our programs. And I think it's not a question, from my perspective, perspective of whether um, somebody will eventually come in and get one of our programs. It's just a question of when. And, and continuing to stick to this strategy of, uh, of really do good, do well. Um, and, and that extends to the full team. And so there's myself, um, I have a lot of government experience. I'm one of the founding partners at Bloom Burton, um, a, a healthcare investment bank. Um, and so that's where our transactional DNA, if you will, comes from. Um, we're always looking at things. We do that at, at, as, a, as a company, as an investment bank as well. I'm also, as part of that, um, one of the single largest shareholders of the company. So I'm not just a hired CEO. Um, I have real skin in the game. I put money into every round um, and I continue to believe in the company. Um, and, uh, and my partners and I are a single larger shareholder in the company um, at, at a little over 20%. Um, and so um, again, when, when the price goes down and we're down where we are now, I feel the pain probably more than um, most, uh, but, but I believe in the story. And so that's why I'm here. Um, Yoav Golan, who's an infectious disease physician, um, He's done lots of work on C. diff and invasive candidiasis, the fungal infection. I would argue that we have um, one of the strongest infectious disease teams of any company out there, not just a small biotech. Um, Ken Howlings, who has 25 years of experience in financial management, is our CFO. Don Sela, 30 years of drug development, is our head of drug development. Fantastic um, get for the, for the program. 
Um, and then Stefan Paquette, um, a young but very, very accomplished um, uh, previous infectious disease scientist and, and really drives a lot of our programs. It extends to our board, Ian Mortimer, um, who folks may know from Xenon, now the CEO at Xenon. Jurgen Froelich, another infectious disease physician um, with lots of experience. Rochelle Stenzler, really, really sharp, independent board member with uh, experience in, in the business space. Brian Bloom, my partner at uh, Bloom Burton on the board, uh, really is Bloom Burton's representative. I'm um, Terry Matskovitz, I'm um, also an infectious disease focused um, uh, person, uh, chief of drug development at Matinas, who's developing a reformulation of an antifungal drug, um, and then uh, of course myself. Um, uh, just a quick financial snapshot, we're a public company, um, so all of this is out there, but I'll, I'll reiterate it quickly. Um, $80 million raised in total, of that 25 million and growing, not including the, the money that we'll be getting um, from, uh, from DITRA, is a government assistance or non-dilutive funding. That's a real plus for this company. Um, we have, uh, as, as of December 31st, we have 9.4 million. Um, we have other government grants of about 2.4 million, again, not counting the 10 million plus until it's actually in the door. Um, 102 million shares fully diluted, um, uh, TSX listed. Um, we are, coming out of the penalty box for favipiravir, but clearly um, we're still, you know, folks I think are, are taking a watchful waiting approach to what we're doing, but I think we're undervalued um, at 8.9 million Canadian. Um, and again, just to disclose it, um, I'm not only the CEO, but um, I'm one of the founding uh, partners um, at Bloom Burton and one of the founders of this company, and we own about 20% of, uh, of the company. Folks can certainly reach out to me. Um, I treat all shareholders um, as important. If you own one share of Apelli, this is my contact information. If you own no shares and want to own shares or just talk about it, I'm generally available. But for our shareholders, always available. Um, I, will, I will make the time. Um, I can't say it will be the same day, but I'll do, I'll do the best I can because I think it's actually really important. Um, Armand, um, with uh, Innova Corp, one of your the big uh, shareholder, yeah, Innova Corp, who are they? So Innova Corp is a, is a, they're actually not one of our large shareholders. They're they're um a, a, they're um uh our non one of our non retail shareholders. I think they probably own about seven percent now, uh, maybe maybe a little bit less. They started a bit higher, but it's a a, a public private fund out of the Maritimes, um, and they really came on board right from the beginning. So they were one of our institutional shareholders in the beginning. And sorry, just on the cash side of things, um, like you're, you're getting for the um, uh, 1701 program, you're, that's getting largely fully funded. Um, I believe at the end of Q3, you had 10 million cash in the, the bank. What's your burn rate or, or the, the cash you have on, on hand, assuming that the government funds come in as, as expected? How much of a runway does this uh, give you? Yeah, so we had significant costs for our favipiravir program that are still um, not necessarily captured there. Um, uh, but um, but you're correct. Um, we we will be going back to the markets at some point. I think that's just the life of a biotech. I think that's pretty safe to assume. Although we're trying to minimize the dilution down here, um, uh, but uh, uh, we anticipate um, that uh, we want to have a fully uh, stocked up. Program. Some of these are quite expensive. 2307 is quite expensive. Our GNA is pretty is pretty low. We're burning about 500,000 a month now. Um, and uh, um, some of those costs will go up pretty significantly um, around 2307 with clinical trials. You can imagine those are expensive. And so I think um, that's the real decision point for us. Of course, if we were just going forward with programs that are government funded, we, we have a, a pretty long cash runway. But um, uh, we have to make those kinds of decisions about which programs we move forward um, and, and which we don't. Um, but, uh, but right now, those are the programs we're moving forward. And um, um, we'll, we'll certainly give some more guidance when the government funds come in. Um, uh, I don't want to go too deep into it here because as a public company, I can't you know, disclose anything like that. But, but our public disclosures kind of give us, give us runway to move these programs forward. Um, our goal is to have um, you know, two years of cash on hand, um, and and that's kind of what we'll be shooting for going forward. And just to clarify, the government funding for the seventeen oh one that's that's going to get clarified in in Q two of this year. Is that I, right? I believe that um, yeah H H one. Um, yeah. So yeah yeah. So we have a different fiscal quarter system, but um, yeah yeah. But yeah, but H calendar year H one. 
Um, so by until, the end of June or by, by the summer end of June, sometime. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. I think that's right. that's very that's safe. And of course, if it if it goes much more than that, it's government contracting. It's always hard to tell, but yeah. it's been very very friendly um, up until now. All right. Okay. Um, just a, a couple uh, little questions. It, it's a little far out uh, in 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 time frame. Uh, when it, I guess, one of the benefits of the seventeen oh one program, if that is successful, you don't really have commercialization issues. You don't have to worry about marketing. Government just writes these contracts, and and you go there. Um, on yeah. and on the other programs, it's whatever. It's obviously not a near term concern. Would is the general strategy, would you sort of out license it, let someone else deal with the marketing and the commercialization of it? Or is that part of the long term plan is then to build out that side of your business? So, so this point, um, I feel very comfortable guiding on, right? And because I have a very strong opinion about this, and I've said this many times, I do not want to be um, a sales, commercial sales organization. That is not our expertise. Um, no. It's incredibly expensive. And most importantly, um, most of the anti-infective companies that you've seen fail over the last couple of years have failed with approved products trying to build a sales force. And so I, I don't think that we should be going there. Um, and I think, it, it, listen, if we have a blockbuster program and we, we bring in a lot of cash and we want to grow by um, acquisition um, and, and have some, uh, I think that's a, that's a different situation. Um, but right now there are no plans within the company to build a sales force or do commercialization ourselves. So we think that it's a, it's a we, we plan to partner. And as a matter of fact, part of the press release that, that folks um, read down through it with Long Zone or Jonathan Goodman is the rights that Knight picks up um, to our programs moving forward. Um, they pick up the right to be the distributor of, of our approved programs um, where they're not otherwise partnered like 1501 in Canada, uh, Mexico, uh, Latin America, and Israel. And so we, we believe that they have the expertise to do that, and we're happy to let them do that. So that was part of the attractiveness for them as well. I'm curious, on the PRV uh, program, like, you, the, like the market is around $100 million once you've accomplished it. Do people ever sort of sell the option or sell it like, hey, we're looking pretty good. You can, if we get it, pay us now $30 million, And if we succeed, then you, you get to have it. But sort of discounted due to risk and you could pocket the money now? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Um, uh, I, I don't want to attach a number to it, yeah. but it absolutely, as you get closer, the pressure for somebody to step in and do that becomes greater. Um, and, and I think it absolutely, again, this is just speculation on my part, but I'm, I'm uh, very confident that Jonathan Goodman's um, uh, positive view of our company and, and desire to come on as an observer and really help move these things forward is because we have two shots on goal with these PRBs right now. Um, and, and so he really appreciates these programs. He recognizes the value of them and companies have been purchased as they get closer to that, um, to that uh, event, the threshold event um, uh, in anticipation of the PRBs. It may be cheaper. Frankly, if, if I was out in the world looking at companies that have potential PRVs as a pill eye gets closer, if our market cap was where it is, it's a lot cheaper to just buy the whole company um, and for the PRVs than it would be to buy a PRV once you have it in hand, a potential PRV. And so I absolutely, it makes uh, folks uh, interested in what we're doing. Right. Um, I am out of questions here. Is there anything we haven't uh, sort of talked about or mentioned that we, uh, you'd like to highlight before we uh, wrap things up? No, I, you know, I think, you know, I think this idea of being in the penalty box following a failed phase three is not a novel concept, no. right? I mean, this is, this is how biotech works. And I think we tend to overshoot. Um, wh what I will say is that I feel like we're starting to come out of it in terms of um, platforms like this. Um, and, and what's really interesting is that um, sometimes folks are shocked that this was all going on in the background. I think if we go back to before COVID, we were talking about the same thing, but COVID sucked all of the energy out of the room. And, and so we really couldn't even talk about this, but these programs have been going on in the background and they're doing exactly what they were designed to do, which was to absorb a potential failure so that the company doesn't live or die on one program. And I think investors were so singularly focused on, on uh, COVID therapies and favipiravir um, that uh, you know perhaps they lost sight of that. And, and so I'm just glad we get to talk about these programs again um, because uh, I, I don't think we've we've had we have not had to pivot 
um, other than moving back to our other programs, we haven't had to turn into a cancer company or you know, an, a, an immunology company or, or something else. We continue to do what we do. We think it's a unique space and we're very good at it. Um, and we're gonna keep uh, driving forward with these programs and, and support like uh, we get with the 1701 program, I think is validation of our approach. Um, and so I'm confident that we'll get there. And over the, the coming, like through the remainder of the year, you've actually got um, a fair amount, like all of your programs seem to, are you gonna be having news flow? You're gonna be getting the DOD stuff uh, coming out, your antifungal with phase two, your, um, uh, there should be a lot of new, fair amount of news flow coming out. I, I think so. And, and so just projecting out over the next three months to six months, um, I, I think we'll be, uh, hopefully we'll be announcing a, a new program. I'm confident we will. We'll be announcing the finalized um, uh, contract uh, with, uh, with the U.S. government. Um, there are other non-dilutive funding sources that are also looking at this program. I'm hopeful we can announce those. Um, potential partnerships um, or expansions of partnerships like we did with um, Subtalis. So yeah, I agree. I think we have, a, we have good news flow to take us through the summer um, and into the fall as well. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm pleased with what we have uh, teed up. Armand, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to chat. Uh, that was uh, interesting and a whole lot of uh, information there and a whole lot going on at yep. uh, Little Apillai. Well, I, I appreciate it. Yep, we are Little Apillai and uh, we, are, we are moving forward. So um, I'm happy to uh, take the time. And, and uh, again, I'll, I'll talk to anybody anytime about this stuff. I'm passionate about it. So that's good. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. And hopefully we'll get you back in a little while and we can talk about um, how the ball has uh, moved forward on the, on all, all, all these uh, different projects. Great. Thanks, Martin. Cheers.